Hallelujah. Let's give a hand to Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. Um, my wife, Dr. Lisa, we were just in the car right before we, we came in tonight, and uh, we just we're just thanking God for the rock and um, the amazing church that we have. We, you know, sometimes you have to travel around the world to see what you have, how blessed you are. And, um, you know, we have an incredible church here. And, you know, we were thanking God just for the leadership, that, that the healthy leadership that God's given, Pastors Dan and Jess and, and Pastors Luke and Stacy and Pastor Jim and Deborah, who laid the foundation of this church and, and turned the name of the church from the Rock Church to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And um, we just see God raising up a heart for missions in the church. And, and we have watched how God is just growing this, this, this desire to send teams around the world to, to partner with us. We work in 146 countries, and the rock is just side by side in all that we do around the world. And so uh, whatever you sow into this church, you're sowing into the world. And uh, we just came back. Literally, some of the footage you're about to see was filmed three days ago on Sunday um, afternoon, we were water baptizing people in the Mongolian River that wasn't too uh, warm, but it was a magnificent sight just watching people going under the waters of baptism. And we took a team here from the rock to, to Mongolia. And uh, I want you just to turn your eyes to the screen. We're just going to start with just a short report from Mongolia. You're going to watch and see your missions dollars at work in the nations of the world. Let's watch it. Church, uh, Dr. Baron here speaking to you from the heart of Mongolia. We've just come from a service where we saw just so many people give their hearts to Jesus. We had a wonderful time. We're here in this uh, amazing country. We've had uh, an opportunity to be able to bring the gospel here. Um, we're so excited to see what God's doing in this country and we're glad to represent the Rock Church. The Rock Church is just so uh, amazing in the way that you guys have a heart for the world. And you're here with a team of six people from the Rock. We've had an amazing time with the young people as well as with the leaders speaking on youth ministry, children's ministry. Um, and we're going to be speaking as well throughout this week going into the inland part of this country to a camp where we're going to speak to leaders from five different cities. I want to say um, a heartfelt thank you uh, to Rock Church for sending these beautiful people, uh, uh, Bern and Lisa, uh, Bob and uh, Marilyn, Christina and Bradley. These guys are true, uh, fantastic uh, representation of, of your church and of, of the kingdom of, of heaven in general. And we really uh, know in the spirit that this is God's provision and God's relationship you know, He's building for upcoming a great future for us, for you guys, and for, for the global church in general. We are a small bunch of people, but yeah, we believe in significance of what God is doing in us and through us, and we believe in you guys, and we believe that this is the amazing time we've never had previously. Keep walking in the Spirit, keep sticking to the Lord Jesus, keep loving Him, and just keep worshiping Him through uh, with all of your hearts, souls, and minds, and strength and uh, blessings from Emmanuel Church, Mongolia. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for sowing into world missions. Thank you for helping us to bring the gospel here to Mongolia. Blessings to you, Rock Church. Uh, keep doing what you're doing and keep loving the world and sowing into world missions and doing what you do to love people to life. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Um, that statue there is a statue of uh, Genghis Khan, which is, uh, they pronounce Chengis Khan, which is the, the name that they call it in, in Mongolia. And I really have to say I was fairly ignorant of, of just the impact that the Mongolian Empire um, had around the world. It um, was the second uh, empire only to the British Empire. But Mongolia ruled the, the, the nations of the world. They ruled from India all the way through to China, to Russia, um, even through the Middle East and even into, uh, into Europe. So um, 
I just was, you know, amazed that this small country, I mean, it's a small population, it's a huge uh, area, but the Mongol in the 12th, 13th centuries um, literally ruled the world. And uh, they brought commerce and they brought, uh, uh, they abolished slavery, they abolished torture, um, they raised up leadership, and, um, and they obviously, uh, in those generations, it was, a, it was they, they ruled with brutal force, but but they also brought an enormous open door for Christianity because many of, their, uh, of the leaders of that movement were Christians. So, um, you know, I, I just felt like it was strategic that God sent us back to Mongolia and um, that we connected with them. We took in the microchips. We took in schools, uh, ISOM training schools in the Mongolian language and the Russian language and the Mandarin Chinese language. Mongolia sandwiched between Russia and China. Uh, and to the west, you see uh, Kazakhstan. And um, we just had an amazing time. Bob and Marilyn Pitts are here. They did an incredible job uh, teaching on cleansing stream. And, and uh, Brad, uh, to the youth, I mean, he just rocked the youth. The youth just, I mean, the power of God fell on them. Many youth were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That guy who was water baptized there, Brad, in his tent, led him to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And um, we saw just many young people get on fire for God. And uh, we just want to thank God. Thank God for the rock for helping us to go and to sow into world missions. Let's give Jesus a hand for letting that happen. Amen. And I just wanted to use that to lead right into the, to the message that's on my heart tonight, which is I've titled the message, um, Living Life in the Light of Eternity. The Living Life in the Light of Eternity. Um, many years ago, I, I, I heard of a, of, a, of a man out of Australia. Um, his name was Arthur Stace. And I'm just going to read you very briefly his, his life story in a, in a, in a synopsis. Uh, um, Arthur Stace um, was an incredible guy out of Sydney, Australia. Let me just give you a little bit of his background. And, um, I'm just going to read this because I think it will be a much more uh, concise way of bringing it to you. Um, Arthur Stace was a loser, a no-hoper, an alcoholic, and completely illiterate. He lived in the streets of Sydney, Australia, regarded by many who saw him as a lost cause. One Sunday night in 1932, he entered St. Barnabas Anglican Church on Broadway in Sydney and heard the Reverend T.C. Hammond preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Arthur was convicted by the Spirit of God. He left the church, crossed the road, and sat under a tree in Victoria Park, where he committed his life to Jesus Christ. He had become a new creation. Later that year, he heard the evangelist John G. Ridley preaching. In his urgent, commanding voice, John Ridley cried, Eternity, eternity. Oh, that this word could be emblazoned across the streets of Sydney. Arthur Stace, the little man who still could not read or write, left the ch that church, and he took some yellow chalk. He bent down and wrote one word on the footpath. He learned to write one word, the word eternity. And throughout the night, for the next 40 years, while Sydney slept, Arthur would take his chalk and write in immaculate copper plate handwriting the word eternity. He wrote it on footpaths, entrances to the train stations, and anywhere else he thought it would catch people's attention. Sydney commuters would alight from their commuter trains each morning and see this word as they walked to work. The word eternity became famous in the city and became an emblem of Sydney. As the year 2000 was welcomed, the word eternity in Stace's handwriting was emblazoned not across the streets of Sydney as John Ridley had wished, but across the face of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And if we're going to be putting that up there, we should see a picture of it shortly. Um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and thanks to modern technology, was seen around the world. Remember that Australia, was, uh, Sydney, Australia is the first city in the entire world that gets the new year. So it was the first city of the new millennium. Of all the words that have been spoken during the first two millennia, the one chosen by otherwise godless people to be featured on the Harbour Bridge at the dawn of the year 2000 is the one that was used to remind so many busy Sydney residents of their impending appointment with their creator. Because Sydney's fireworks display was the first of the international celebrations to be telecast around the globe, people in every continent witnessed the miracle that God performed when he touched the life of one little insignificant man, Arthur Stace, a man who heard the voice of God and responded by committing his life to preaching his one-word sermon. 
Heaven only knows how God will continue to speak to the hearts of so many people around the globe using the work he started back in the 1930s through Arthur Stace and his piece of yellow chalk. In Sydney today, you can still see the word on his gravestone in Waverley Cemetery commemorating the life of Arthur Stace, who's become known as Mr. Eternity. Amen. Did we see that? Did we see the actual Sydney Harbour Bridge? I think they showed it, right? And, you know, this man's story just inspired me so much that I, um, I really, really, it came to my heart like, God, what, what was that message that he heard that inspired a person that for 40 years he only wrote one word, the word eternity? And God just began to stir in my heart how much we as believers must live our lives with our eyes on eternity. Um, I'm going to put up a scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3 verses 10 and 11. And Solomon's writing this book and he's saying, he's just giving prophetically what uh, the way we are as human beings. And he said, I've seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for his own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in every person's heart. We have a sense that that you know we are eternal beings we're not created for a moment we're not created just for this short life that we live here on this planet the bible says we are eternal souls and that is uh you know god's placed the sense and the understanding of eternity in every person's heart and the bible says that if you go from genesis to revelation that god requires that we live with one eye on eternity he requires that eternity be something that we don't just, you know, pay lip service to or think about once every great while. Eternity needs to be something that is extremely important to us. That's something that, that we are continually, you know, keeping one eye on. We're continually living our lives in the light of that eternity because your, your life here is a moment. It's a blip on the screen compared to the eternal life. Jesus himself talked about this and he said this in Matthew 18 verses 8 and 9 and it may sound like it's a gory illustration however Jesus is emphasizing the 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 weight of this issue he says here in Matthew 18 8 and 9 if so if your hand or foot causes you to sin cut it off and throw it away it's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire both with both of your hands and feet if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with one eye than to have two eyes be thrown into the fire of hell. And it's not about cutting out eyes and cutting off hands. That's not what this scripture is about. It's about whatever it takes to secure and to hold on to eternal life is what we need to do. That's how weighty it is to God. It's like it's worth everything. Jesus is saying, you know, whatever it takes in your life to secure your salvation and to secure eternal life for yourself, you need to, you need to, take, you need to take attention to it. And if you find that something is, 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 is hindering or stopping or preventing your life from progressing in God and is continually drawing you away, you need to take radical action to stop that. Amen? You cannot toy and play with your eternity. It's the most important thing in, 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 in the world. And we, we need to do radical things to preserve and protect it. You know, I, I often think of the story of Lazarus and, and the rich man. And I mean, Jesus told the story and it's interesting that he used real people's names and he used Lazarus's name and he, t he talked about the rich man and he talked about you know, the rich man had five brothers and there's a lot of details in the story and most uh, Bible scholars believe that that story is a real, actual, um, Jesus is telling a real story about, you know, this rich man and a beggar. Now, from our perspective on the earth, we would say, you know what, you know, that rich man is the, is, is the guy who's fortunate and then the beggar, you know, he had a miserable life. But in light of eternity, I'd rather be the beggar. Because, you know, if the rich man ends up where he ended up and the, and the beggar ended up for eternity where he ended up, you know what? Give me the beggar. I'll be the beggar and, you know, have a moment of trial and, and an eternal life of, with God and, and enjoying him forever. You know, it puts things into a different perspective. What does it mean to live life in the light of eternity? 
first thing I want to I want to put before you is that that we as believers, if we're going to live with an eternal perspective, we must live with a multi generational mindset. We must live with a multi generational mindset because so many people are just living for the moment. They're not understanding the consequences of what they do. They're not understanding that this is a generational thing that we're involved in. That we as believers, that we are not just living for ourselves, but you know, even the freedom for our future, this, this campaign to pay off the church, it, the, the purpose of it is to seed into the next generation a, a, a place and that is ours, that belongs to the kingdom of God and a place for the next generation to rise up and do something for God. Yes. Amen? So we must have a multi-generational mindset and when we don't think of an eternal uh, uh, pattern, an eternal plan for our lives and for our future, for our families, for what God has called us on the earth to do, when we just think of it in the moment and we only look at ourselves and we only are self-centered, you know, I really believe it violates the heart of God. There's, a, there's a, um, an interesting um, correlation in the Bible between Esau and Jacob. And, and God makes this statement that he says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And I always used to think, God, why, would, why, did, you like, why did you love Jacob? Jacob was the, was the scoundrel. I mean, Jacob's name means deceiver. Jacob is the one who deceived his father. He deceived his brother. He, he went off and, and, you know, he did, I mean, he did a lot of bad things, Jacob did. But, you know, God says, I love Jacob, but I don't like Esau. And, uh, and we go down to the New Testament, and there's an interesting statement in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, where um, the writer of Hebrews is talking about, uh, about Esau. And he says these words, he says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. Now what he did, and this is why God this was displeased with Esau, was that he traded his future, he traded his eternal uh, inheritance, which was his lineage and everything that God had given him, he traded it for one moment of pleasure. And there's many Christians that, you know, trade their eternal life for a night of sin or for, you know, an affair or for whatever it may be that, that you know, is, 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 is driving them. They don't understand that this is an eternal world that we live in and that you cannot, you know, you cannot take this, the, the momentary pleasure of, of a moment and, and somehow, you know, um, exchange it for something eternal. Your salvation is eternal. Your life is eternal. And you have to realize that you cannot live in a, in a momentary decision-making process. You have to see the next generation. You've got to see the inheritance that God's given you. You've got to see the future, the future of your personal life, of the church, of your family, of the business that God's given you, or whatever it is. We have to live with a multi-generational mindset. This is probably one of the first generations in this nation that you know, we're, we're seeding into the next generation. Trillions of dollars of debt. We're selling it, sowing into this next generation, you know, a, a bankrupt morality. We're, we're giving over and seeding into another generation because we are just living for ourselves and for the moment as a nation. And not looking at what we're seeding into that next generation and what are they going to inherit. I'm just being honest here. We must live with the light of it. We must live multi-generationally. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a king by the name of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, you know, had, you know, had an incredible experience. He, was a, he served God. He was a good king. But he, um, you know, he got sick. And he cried out to God to heal him. God says, you know, you're going to die. And, and, and he, he prayed this incredible prayer. And God says, I'm giving you 15 more years. And, 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 and God healed him supernaturally. And so now he's, you know, he's enjoying his new health and he's enjoying that. And the Babylonians send some envoys to him just to congratulate him on getting healed. And when they come, Hezekiah just shows them everything. And this is what the prophet comes to him, prophet Isaiah, uh, comes to him and, and says the following thing. He says, Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah, asked him, what did those men want? And where were they from? 
Hezekiah replied, they came from the distant land of Babylon. What did they see in your palace? Isaiah asked. They saw everything, Hezekiah replied. I showed them everything I own, all my royal treasuries. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from the Lord. The time is coming when everything in your palace, all the treasures stored up in you by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your very own sons will be taken into exile, away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of Babylon's king. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, This message you have given me from the Lord is good. For the king was thinking, At least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. That's like just, you know, it's so, that to me is just a heartbreaking statement that, that he only thought of himself. He's only thought, well, at least it's going to be peace in my time. And who cares what happens to the future? And Babylon came and because he had shown them everything, they came and they, they, they took it all. Because Hezekiah was not looking at multi-generationally. He was not concerned, didn't care about that next generation. And if we want to live with the eyes on eternity, we must care about the next generation. We must raise up the next generation. We must reach the next generation. We must sow into the next generation. Amen? We cannot remove the ancient landmarks. And we must understand the impact of our lives and of our actions and of what we do on our children and our grandchildren. That's the first area, living multi-generationally. Number two, we've got to put our lives and world in proper context and we need to learn to understand consequence. You know what, so often we get overwhelmed with what life brings us and what comes at us and, and you know, we, we, we just want to give up, we want to throw in the towel and and, and, and things that we, you know, experience really can overwhelm us. And I'm interested, you know, when, when the Apostle Paul's writing in, in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, he says, listen guys, if you change your perspective, if you change the way you look at life, and you look at the problems of life, and you change the way, and you put things into a proper perspective and a proper context, then the stuff that you're facing in this world is going to have a whole different perspective and a whole different light. This is what he writes. He says this in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. He says, that is why we never give up. Everybody say, never give up. Never. If you quit, you lose. If you finish in faith, you win. So you ought to finish in faith no matter what happens. The whole world collapses around you, finish in faith, and you win. Amen? He says, that's why we never give up. And then he says, though our bodies are dying. How many of you know that our bodies are dying? I mean, yeah, we haven't died yet, but you know, they're dying every day. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles... Now, his troubles were like being beaten and shipwrecked and, you know, almost killed and stoned. And I mean, he says his present troubles are small. They won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Amen. Amen. If we change our perspective, we won't let life overwhelm us. We won't let life take over. We've got to see that this stuff is just small stuff in light of eternity. Soon it's going to be all gone. We don't have to deal with this. But we can sweat the small stuff if we keep our eyes in the perspective of eternity. If eternity, if we have an eternal perspective, then we can get through the stuff that we're going through. Yeah. Then we're not going to let it get us down. We're not going to let it destroy us. We're not going to let it do anything to us because, hey, it's a momentary. In light of eternity, it's a blip on the screen. It's a drop in the ocean. Because eternity... It's forever. So when we, when we get a right perspective, it's going to help us to make right decisions. So many people don't realize that how we live and what we do really, really does impact eternity. 
it impacts generationally and it also impacts forever. And the idea of consequences, it's, you know, I worked for Reinhard Bonker. Uh, Lisa and I were, were on his media team. I was his television producer. And so there's certain things about his ministry that I know very, very well because I, I filmed them. I was there when they happened. They, they I personally witnessed things. And this particular story was, was one that I, I know, I know all the players or many of the players involved in it. And it was a man, and you can, you can look on his website. I think it's called Raised from the Dead. And it's a man in the city of Onitsha. Onitsha is where Pastor Jim and I went when we actually first went in. I took Pastor Jim to see whether I'm supposed to go to Nigeria. We went for two years as missionaries there. And we went to the city of Onitsha. We went into the home of the man where this miracle happened. He was the pastor of that church. We preached in his church. And when we were missionaries there, we started many, many schools in his movement, probably at least 20 to 30 schools in his network. So we know the players. And then I know Reinhardt's television team because I helped to train him. And I know the people, and I know Reinhardt himself, that I've spoken and talked with him about this man who died and his wife refused. He was a pastor. And he refused to, you know, accept death. He, I mean, the wife was basically held on to the scripture where wives will receive their, their, their husbands back from the dead. Oh, it's, a book, it's in the book of Hebrews, uh, where wives receive their dead back from the dead. And she just held on to that scripture. And she carried the body for three days around in the coffin. They already had put the, the um, you know, what do you call the thing that stops you, the embalming liquid into this person's body. That's how dead he was. And they took him into the church when they would, Reinhard was there dedicating the new building. And he was preaching upstairs. He didn't even know this was happening. And they brought this body into the church. Well, they said, we don't want the body in the middle of the church in the dedication service. So they, of course, put him downstairs under the building in the children's area where they had a, you know, underground, under, uh, the underground rooms and the children were there in that room. And, and so about four or 500 believers gathered around and they began to pray for this man. And it took many hours and his body began to warm and they prayed and sang and worshiped and prayed and sang and worshiped. And the guy came back from the dead after being dead for three days. I mean, it was an amazing miracle. And even Snopes does not discredit it. And not that we listen to Snopes, but anyway, it's a, but I'm just saying that this, this is a real thing. Reinhard has told me about the man. The man now lives in, in, in East London and Southern Africa and, and just uh, an, an incredible, incredible story. And, and, and his story, everybody rejoiced worldwide when this happened, but he told about, you know, um, amazing things that God showed him while he was dead. And then he also shared some things where God showed him hell. And he had an encounter with hell. And, um, and this was what was disconcerting to many people because in the flames of hell was another pastor that this pastor knew. And he was crying from the flames of hell and he said, I'm, I'm ready to return the money I stole right away. Something to that effect that, that this man had been embezzling money in the church. And here he was eternally in a place where he could, had, could not get out of it. And, and this man says he felt helpless to help him because he knew the man on the earth. He never knew that he had done that, but here he was. And people were like, oh, no, well, you know, you're a Christian. You're just going to go to heaven. And you know what? If you steal from God, that's not going to be a good... You don't, you don't have guarantees, all right? So... The consequence of what we do on this earth is really, really important for us to, to, to realize. We saw that Cheryl Salem's coming to, to the church, and she is an amazing woman of God. And just, uh, we probably did one of the greatest recordings we've ever done as a ministry. In fact, we have some copies back there called Overcoming Grief, where she, in two sessions, shares the testimony of losing her uh, five-year-old to a brain tumor. And Cheryl just pulls out her heart. It's, it, it helps that she was Miss America and that she knows how to use the camera because she is so experienced in that. So her ability to communicate her story was, was absolutely second to none. It's one of the greatest recordings that we've ever done. And she tells about the loss of her child and how heartbroken she was and how depressed she was. And, and, 
and just, you know, if you know the story uh, of what happened that, that, you know, she ended up getting cancer after her child had passed away and she said, God, take me home. I don't want to live anymore and just, I want to die too. And, and so she was actually uh, ready to give, to go home and be with Jesus. And they were going to do a final operation just to try and save her life. They didn't even think she'd survive the operation. She's on the gurney going into the operation and saying goodbye to her husband, her two other sons. And she basically was saying, I'm going to see my daughter on the other side. And she gets caught out of her body and she's in the presence of Jesus. And she has this face-to-face -face encounter with, with, with the Son of God. And she thinks she's in heaven. She's died and she hasn't. She's just been having an encounter with Jesus Christ. It's an amazing, amazing story. It's, a, it's phenomenal what she shares. But what Jesus does is now, Cheryl begins to now, you know, challenge and say, Jesus, well, what, what, if you're the Lord and why did my daughter die? And you know what, am I heartbroken about what happened? And I can't stop thinking about her. And she's just, you know, she's complaining. She's in the presence of Jesus. You'd think she'd have some other words, but she didn't. And Jesus changes her perspective. And this is, this is what Jesus says to her. He says, Cheryl, your daughter is not in your past. She's in your future. Stop looking at it wrong. This life is a moment. We're going to be with our loved ones again. If we live life in life of, of eternity, our perspective changes. We don't, we don't mourn like others because we know our loved ones will be waiting for us. And as soon as her perspective changes, it changes everything. And if we live life in light of eternity, it changes how we see life. It changes how we see problems. It changes how we see the issues of this world. We don't let them get to us. Reinhardt used to say, don't let it scratch at you. <laughs> so often, Lisa and I turn to each other, we get facing something and say, don't let it scratch at you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So don't let it scratch at you. Change your perspective. Amen? In Exodus 34, verse 7, God says these words. He says, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. And he's speaking about those that love him and serve him. And, and God's love and his blessing, if you serve him and you do his will, is a thousand generations will be blessed because of, of your love and obedience for God. Amen? But God says, if you choose to do a life of sin, he says, he goes on and he says, I forgive iniquity, rebellion and sin, but I don't excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. And your sins will impact to the third and fourth generation. Your obedience will affect to a thousand generations. You make a choice of which one you would rather have. Amen? We need to have an eternal perspective. We need to understand the consequence of what we do and how we live. And the last thing I want to just touch on is that we need to live with the right perspective of reward. This tremendous reward. And when we, when we give and when we, when we sow into the kingdom of God, when we win souls, when we do things of kingdom value, you think that, okay, you're just doing something right here. When you sow us into the mission field, when you give towards uh, the work of the kingdom of God, you don't understand what you're doing. In the eternal perspective because it has eternal impact it has eternal reward Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 he says don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal sometimes in the form of the government no it's not in that sorry I mean Jesus is saying, this is exactly what happens to money on the earth. He says in verse 20, store up, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is there, the desires of your heart will also be. What Jesus is saying here is that you can't take anything with you, nothing. Came with nothing, you're leaving with nothing. But you can send it ahead of you. 
He says, you can store up, while you're on the earth, you can store up treasure in heaven. You can send eternal treasure. You can translate it, it, natural treasure into eternal treasure through investing in kingdom purposes, in the kingdom of God. And if you have, if you have a kingdom mindset and you have an eternal mindset, this is not about this life. This is about an eternal life. This is about storing up things that are going to never get taken by the enemy, that are never going to get stolen, never going to be lost, never going to be broken into. You have an eternal reward. Amen? And we have the right perspective. It's much easier to sow into kingdom business and kingdom purposes. Probably one of the, probably the, the largest gift that was ever given to our ministry was given, you know, by a person who came and, and, and God, you know, uh, this person said, I'm giving this, this seed into the kingdom, but I have one requirement that nobody knows I'm giving it. And I'm thinking, that person has an eternal perspective. They have an eternal perspective because they didn't just want, they didn't want the reward, right? Even though they're going to, you know, get blessed by all the, that we do around the world, their mindset was, I want the reward up there. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And when people have that, it just touches my heart so much. Now, you can't take anything with you. You can send it ahead. But people also, we had a, 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 one of our students, and in fact, Pastor Paul knows uh, from Las Vegas, and this person just went on a mission trip to Peru and, and saw what, what our work does in, down in South America, and, uh, even among the Quechua Indu Indians and into Peru. And, and this person left funds when, when they passed away. And they, they left funds to, to which we've been able to do so much work around the world. And this man left this, the, this, this seed and said to his mother, he says, when I go, I'm going to do something that's going to touch the whole world. So whichever way, you can send it ahead, you can't take it with you, but you can leave it behind, and you can continue to bring resources into kingdom purposes. Amen. John chapter 4, verse 36. This talks about us winning souls and, and, and going out and doing the work of the kingdom. In verse 36, it says here, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together when we build the kingdom of God when we win souls here at the rock so many people you know when the altar call happens you know they they kind of check out oh we've heard this altar call before let me tell you you're reaping souls those souls are yours they're eternal souls and whatever they do for the kingdom and so the, the right thing to do is to pray. And as that altar call is going forward, you're interceding and saying, God, bring another one in because I want that fruit in eternal life. Amen. When you bring somebody, you're, 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 you're reaping eternal fruit. We need to have that mindset. And as we, as we close this out here, Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about what we have lying ahead of us. The, the New Jerusalem. We have the city of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 20 says, it says, You and us as the church have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You've come into the assembly of God's firstborn children, those whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You've come to the spirits of righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. You've come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness. That's what lies ahead for all of us. And if we have that mindset, that's what we're living for. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. And we need to keep that in the right perspective. Daniel chapter 12, this is the last scripture. At that time, Daniel's seeing the future. He's seeing what's going to happen on the earth, probably in, in our generation. And we know there's going to be a lot of bad stuff happening before good stuff happens. Amen. We know that we're in for a shaking of the earth and that there's going to be, you know, we see the forces of darkness rising up all over the earth. And we're looking and we know that this end times is coming. In verse number 12, Daniel says this in 12, 12, 
At that time, Michael the archangel, who stands God over your nation, the nation of Israel, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Who wants to be one of those who shine like the stars forever? Amen. And you look at the message of the prodigal son and you look at, uh, many people look at the, that great story of the, the son who he goes off, squanders in his whole father's existence and, and, you know, comes back and the father is waiting and we, we all know that wonderful story. The father runs and greets the son and brings out a feast and, 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 and gives him a robe and puts a ring on his finger and we all think, you know, praise God that prodigal son came home. And then you get the story of the other son, and the other son's just, you know, wounded and hurt. He's like, I served you all of my life, and you know what? I've, I've done your will. I've, I've, I've lived, and I've done right things. And here's this, you know, this brother of mine has just squandered everything, and he's gone and, you know, thrown away the family inheritance. And, you know, how come he gets this party? It's a very interesting way that the father answers back. You see, the younger son, he comes back, and he gets... A rave, he gets a robe, and he gets a ring. But the father says these words. He says, son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. Which means that nothing belonged to the other son. Nothing. He got a party, and he came back, and he had, you know, uh, he, you know he, they rejoiced. But you know what? I'd rather have the reward. I'd rather have the inheritance. I'd rather have what God's prepared for our lives if we will serve Him and we will be there and we will be faithful and do His will. I'd rather have that reward and we need to live our lives with our eye on the reward. Amen? In our giving and what we sow and what we do and how we live. I'm going to close with this reading and it's, it's, it just impacted my life and it came to my heart and this is... This is, this is um, it's from a book called Final Quest. It's by Rick Joyner. Um, it's a very interesting book. Um, uh, not everything that Rick Joyner has written to me is, 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 you know, is something that I you know, embrace a thousand percent. But this particular um, account that he has where God takes him up and shows him heaven. And he has this encounter with real people that he's encountered on the earth that are now in heaven. And God is opening his eyes to what's on the other side. And when I read this, it really, it touched my heart because I feel like it speaks to all of us. And I do witness that I feel that this is a real genuine encounter with God. And I'll just read it from, from his book, Final Quest. He says, we were still in the place, so he's up in heaven right now. And God is now showing him the highest kings in heaven, the people who have the biggest thrones, the people who have the greatest rewards, the people that have everything that heaven can offer. And he's in this place. He says, we were still in the place where the highest kings were sitting. Then I recognized a man who was close by. Now, this man's name is Angelo. And he says, sir, I know you from somewhere, but I simply can't remember where. You once saw me in a vision, Angelo replied. I remembered, I immediately remembered and I was shocked. So you were a real person? Yes, he replied. I remember the day when as a young Christian, now this is Rick Joyner speaking, he says, as a young Christian, he said, I, had, I was frustrated with some issues in my life. I went out into the middle of a battlefield park near my apartment and I determined I would wait until the Lord spoke to me. As I sat reading my Bible, I was caught up in a, into a vision, one of the first visions I ever had. And in the vision, I saw a man who was zealously serving the Lord. He was continually witnessing to people, teaching the Bible, visiting the sick to pray for them. He was very zealous for the Lord and had a genuine love for people. Then I saw another man named Angelo, who was obviously a tramp or a homeless person. When a small kitten wandered into his path, he started to kick it, but restrained himself, though he still shoved it out of the way rather harshly with his foot. Then the Lord asked me, which of these men pleased him most? The first one, I said without hesitating. No, said the Lord, 
the second. He responded and began to tell me their stories. He shared me that the first man had been raised in a wonderful family, which had always known the Lord. He grew up in a thriving church and attended one of the best Bible colleges in the country. He'd been given 100 portions of God's love, but he was only using 75. The second man had been born deaf. He was abused. He was kept in a dark, cold attic until he was found by the authorities when he was eight years old. He had then been shifted from one institution to another where the abuse continued. Finally, he was turned out into the streets. The Lord had only given him three portions of his love to help him overcome all of this. But he had mustered every bit of it to fight the rage in his heart and to keep from hurting the kitten. I now looked at that man, a king, sitting on a throne far more glorious than Solomon could ever have imagined. Hosts of angels were arrayed around him, waiting to do his bidding. I turned to the Lord in awe. I said, I still could not believe he was real, much less one of the great kings. Lord, please tell me the rest of the story, I begged. Of course, that's why we're here. Angelo was so faithful with the little I had given to him that I gave him three more portions of my love. He used all of that to quit stealing. He almost starved, but he refused to take anything that was not his. He, brought, he bought his food with what he could make collecting bottles, and occasionally he found someone who would let him do yard work. Angelo could not hear, but he learned to read, so I sent him a gospel tract. As, as he read it, the Spirit opened his heart and he gave his life to me. I again doubled the portion of my love to him, and he faithfully used all of them. He wanted to share me with others, but he couldn't speak. Even though he lived in such poverty, he started spending over half of everything he made on gospel tracts to give out in street corners. How many did he lead to you, I asked the Lord, thinking that it must have been multitudes for him to be sitting with the kings. One, the Lord answered. In order to encourage him, I let him lead a dying alcoholic to me. It encouraged him so much that he would have stood on that corner for many more years just to bring another soul to repentance. But all of heaven was entreating me to bring him here quickly, and I too wanted him to receive his reward. But what did Angelo do, uh, Rick asked, to become a king here, I asked. He was faithful, God says, with all that he was given. He overcame until, all, until he became like me, and he died a martyr. But what did he overcome and how was he martyred? He overcame the world with my love. The very few have overcome so much with so little. Many of my people dwell in homes with conveniences that kings would have envied a century ago, yet they don't appreciate them. Angelo, on the other hand, would so appreciate even a cardboard box on a cold night, he would turn it into a glorious temple of my presence. Angelo began to love everyone and everything. He would rejoice more over an apple than some of my people do over a great feast. He was faithful with all that I gave him, even though it was not very much compared to what I give others, including you. As I looked at Angelo, I could eat, not believe how hard my heart had been. Even so, I did not understand how dying in, in this way made him a martyr. So he, um, he froze to death trying to keep alive an old wino who had passed out in the cold. Even so, I didn't understand how dying this way had made him a martyr, which I thought was a title reserved for those who died because they would not compromise their testimony of the Lordship of Christ. Lord, I know he's truly an overcomer, I remarked, but it truly is, warrant, it, it, but it truly is warranted for him to be here. But are those who die in such a way considered martyrs? And this is what God answered. Angelo was a martyr every day that he lived. He would only do enough for himself to stay alive, and he gladly sacrificed his life to save a needy friend. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, even if you give your body to be burned but don't have love, it counts nothing. But when you give yourself with love, it counts for much. Angelo died every day because he did not live for himself but for others. Even though he always considered himself the least of saints, he was truly one of the greatest. As you have already learned, many of those who consider themselves the greatest and are considered by others to be the greatest end up being the least here in heaven. Angelo did not die for a doctrine or for his testimony. He did die for me, said the Lord. And this story just touched my heart so deeply because I realized that here's a person who, you know, was a homeless person and used everything that God gave him. It's not how much we have. It's how much of what we have that we use for God that matters. Amen. I want us just to close by just believing God to challenge our hearts to live with our lives with an eye on eternity. We can't live for ourselves. We've got to live for a dying world. We've got to live for a next generation. We have to live for 
the, an, an eternal purpose that God has placed us on this earth for. And so I want us just to, you know, to give an opportunity for those who have, have not been living, who have not been living for a, a faith in Jesus Christ. It's just so important that we're dealing with eternal matters. There were so many people that came to Jesus on the earth, including Nicodemus, where Jesus spoke to him about us receiving eternal life. And the questions that people asked was, Jesus, how do we have eternal life? How do we get eternal life? How do we, how do we apprehend that? And how do we step in and, and, and take it on for ourselves? Jesus made that statement and he said, it's not how good you are. It's not how much you've been to church. It's not how much you've given, how much you've done. It's not about your works. It's not about anything that you have accomplished that you think would get you into heaven. Jesus said it to a man who probably had done more than most people. A person who was a leader in the synagogue and somebody who really gave alms and prayed and, and gave to the poor and knew the scriptures. Jesus said, none of that's going to help you. He said, you must be born again. You must come into relationship with God. You must embrace a faith in an eternal Savior. All of us are going to stand before the throne of God. All of us are going to come to that place where we're all going to be judged. The Bible says that we, you know, God's going to lay our lives before us. And, and none of us deserve to get into heaven. There's not one of us here that has done good enough. We've all sinned. The Bible says not one person has not sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. And when God brings our sins before us, there's only one answer that will get you into heaven. And that's an admission saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up. I know I've done wrong. I know, I, you know, all of us have done that. All of us have fallen short of what God expects for our lives. But when we stand before God, we have to have the ability to say to God, but I put my faith when I was on that earth, I put my faith in what your son did to save me. I put my faith that, that when you sent Jesus to this earth and he hung on that, on that cross and he died, that you took my sin and you placed it on him and he died in my place. He went to hell in my place. He paid for every sin that I ever did in my life. And God, I'm forgiven not because of anything I'm good at or anything that I've done. I'm, I'm forgiven because of what Jesus did. And when a person embraces a faith in the eternal Son of God. The Bible says that God washes their lives and Jesus will come into your heart and He will do a miracle. He will, re, he will regenerate your spirit and open up the relationship with God that we were always originally supposed to have. The relationship of having a, a reborn heart that, that communicates with God and that's full of His love and that Jesus comes to take residence in us. But we have to make that choice. You have to cross that threshold. You have to embrace what he did on the cross. And you have to believe that he died in your place. That he died for your sins. And I want to give everybody an opportunity to do that tonight. So I'm going to ask that in a moment. I'm just going to count to three. And if you need to make your life right before God. If you need to embrace a faith in Jesus Christ. On the count of three, I'm just going to count one, two, and three. I'm just going to knock my hands together. And when I hear that sound, I want you to have that as a signal that that's the time to raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, you just, you're not just saying, you know, uh, I, I want Jesus in my head. I, I just want, you are, you are saying to God, I want to embrace a faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for me. And God tonight is going to come into your heart. He's going to forgive everything you've done in your past. His blood's going to wash your, your past clean. And you're going to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. This is for every person here. If you need to make your life right before God, tonight's your night. Jesus went to a cross and died a horrible death for each one of us. Tonight, let's embrace the faith in Him. And you can be born again. You can give your life to Him. And if you've been backslidden and you need to come back to Him, tonight's the night for you to, to come back to Jesus. So on the count of three, I want to just give you every an opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Just raise up your hand wherever you are. If you need to make that decision, you need to give your life to Jesus. I see your hand back there. Uh, anybody else that needs to make that decision tonight, you need to have an eternal perspective. I see your hand. Anybody else? You need to give your life to Jesus Christ tonight. Anybody else? 
Just raise up your hand. You can, it depends what age you are. I was 12 when I gave my heart to Jesus. I want us all to stand in the presence of God. I'm going to ask those two people and anybody else that needs to, as we sing a song, I want you just, if you can come, I'd love to pray with you here up front. If you need to make your life right before God tonight, don't worry about what anybody else is thinking or saying. It's your night tonight to embrace an eternal life, an eternal life with Jesus. There is no life outside of a faith in Jesus Christ. So let's give these people a hand as they come down and let's have the song. Just if you can come down and meet me up front and let's pray together and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Just come forward. God bless you. God bless you as you come. God bless you. Come, come and give your life to Jesus. Come tonight. Get your life right before you and him. He's going to make your life right. Please come forward. Anybody else that needs to make that decision tonight? God bless you. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? I'm going to ask if you, if you have been hanging by a thread in your faith, and you just need to reaffirm your faith. I'm going to ask all our eyes closed. And this is you tonight, that God has put eternity. You have not been living for the eternal. You've been living for the temporal. You've been wasting hundreds of hours of time, whether it's watching sports or whatever it is that has been detracting and taking away from God. And tonight you need to make things right between you and God. Wherever you are, I just want you just to raise up your hand between you and this is between you and God. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but if this message tonight spoke to you, I want you just to raise up your hand. And you need to make things right. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. Anybody else that needs to do that? There are many, many hands going up in different parts of this auditorium. We're going to pray together as a as a family. I want you guys to pray that have come forward tonight. You had enough courage to come forward. God's going to meet you. Well, it's all to close our eyes. Let's pray this together. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for eternal life. It cost you everything. You died a horrible death on a cross. You suffered for my sins. You died in my place. You went to hell for me. And you rose from the dead. You're alive right now. And you're here in this place. I ask you to forgive my past. Wash away my sins. I invite you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. Be the Lord of my time. Be the Lord of my future. I give my future to you. And I ask you, Jesus, to accept me as your child. Wash away the past. Come into my heart. Let me be changed on the inside by your Holy Spirit. And help me to live in light of eternity. Help me to make decisions that please you. I receive you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. I'd like you guys, if you could turn to your left and to my right, here's Antonio here. Just take a few minutes. He's just going to give you some literature and a few things that are going to help you from this point onwards. If you can follow him out and uh, the old friends will wait for you and uh, we will uh, give you a clap as you leave here. Amen.